F main equal to, let's see, pardon me if I don't get this exactly right, but it could be like this, and then it will concatenate that onto it, and when it goes and execute it, it'll execute that update statement, maybe that update statement will fail because the syntax is bad, but then it will go ahead and try to do the delete. All right. So you can wreak havoc by actually injecting SQL through form entry. All right. Now, we didn't know that, right? Or, or the folks didn't know that in class before now. Well, the ASP.NET parameter object takes care and prevents this from happening. All right. So it prevents innocent errors, like what if the name was O'Reilly? and there was a, a apostrophe in the name, not because someone's trying to mess with the system, but just because, hey, that's their name, right? So it, it uh, uh, catches for those errors, but it also catches malicious things. So again, an example of the framework taking something low level that everyone has a potential problem with and handling it on its own, all right? So the good news is if you just go by the book and use these, classes from the framework, it takes care of a lot of that stuff for you. So even if you're not aware of what a SQL injection attack is, um, you're protected from it. All right. There's actually a good cartoon uh, I'll have to bring in next time uh, from that. I don't know. I think I talked about it last time, whatever the name of that site is. But I'll have to remember to bring that in. All right. Our job on the visual part of it is actually even easier. Because all we have to do is say, hey, you are allowed to edit and you are allowed to delete from this grid view. And likewise, on the insert side, you are allowed to, um, or on the, the details view side, you're allowed to insert, edit, and delete. Okay? So... That's actually the easier part. But do remember, again, the database stuff is, is two-pronged, right? We have the data source and we have the visual, so we have to handle both. And they both can be handled separate, and it may seem like a pain, but that's actually good because we can then, for certain users, turn off the ability to delete, for example. All right, they can maybe edit stuff, but they can't delete. All right. Okay. Um... Let's see. Let's consider this. Category name is required, right? So let's go and run this. And let's go and try to put a category name in of nothing. sometimes not there. If you're in edit mode, that text box is there. 
If you're not in edit mode, that text box isn't there. So it's not a control like the kinds of controls we've been doing so far. The controls we've been doing so far, we've been taking a text box and just plopping it on the screen. There it is. It's always there. So I can put a validator on it. This guy, the control only work is there in certain modes. All right? So what do we do to fix that? Well, we still use validators. All right, fortunately, we can still use validators. But we have to make a slight transformation to the grid view. And that is we have to convert that field that we want to validate to what's called a template field. All right? Keep in mind, you know, talking about the philosophy of a framework, the philosophy of a framework is not to do all your work for you. All right? The philosophy of a framework is to take the basics and make it easy to do. And then if you want to go and take it further, to be able to go in and by hand go and modify things to make it work the way you want it to. So in other words, what we've seen so far is the bare bones default behavior of grid views. So, with a grid view, in edit mode, all the columns turns into text boxes. Every single one of them. With no validation attached to them. Alright? Well, what if I want a drop down instead of a text box? Because there's going to be some cases where I don't want a text box, right? I'm going to want a drop down. Alright? And what if I want validation? Well, then I'm extending the default behavior. I'm, I'm, I'm going beyond the default behavior. So I got to do that myself. But that's fine. You know, if I can find someone to do 80% of my work at home, I'd be happy to do 20% of it. Right? So the default behavior takes you so far, and then you can go and you can manually go and make the changes to make it work exactly the way you want it to. So what that involves to sort of customize the behavior of this details view or grid view involves creating a template column. And I'm going to get rid of the details view simply because that's, it's bugging me. It, it, it's, it's in the way. It's, it's clouding the issue. So we're going to start off looking at the grid view. All right. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to say edit columns. And I'm going to pick the one that I want. That is co category name. And I'm going to say convert this field into a template column. All right. Here's where the language is a little confusing. But what that means is, is I am going to customize the way this column acts. How am I going to customize it? Well, I still want it in a text box, but I want a text box that's validated. So, I will go in here and I'll click convert this field into a template field. I can then close out of it. All right. And now I'm ready to customize that field. How do I customize it? I click here and click edit templates. It will show me a list of all of the templates that I have. There's actually two things. There's an empty data template. There's a pager template. Those are just all grid views have those. But the one I'm interested in is there is, for category, I can edit how the category name appears and how it's handled for the item template. That's regular plain old display mode. Alternating item template. That's every other item. So if I like wanted to change the color or something, I could do it that way. The header template, the footer template, the one I am most interested in is the item template. Edit item template, I mean. 
the edit item template is what we get when we what we get for this field when we go in edit mode. So I will click edit item template, and that shows me what we get, and we get a text box. All right, because you know, that's what we get with this, right? We get a text box. This is where I put the validator inside that template, and Here's where I go in and say, oops, required field validator for control to validate text box one. There we go. And now I can put the error message to say must enter category. So to summarize here, template equals customize. So to convert to a template column means I want to customize the way that this field is handled in this grid view or details view. Remember, both the grid view and the details view work in modes. All right. We saw that in the example last week and we saw it today. When I edit it, it's in a label. I'm sorry, when I view it, it's in a label. When I edit it, it's in a text box. We can change any of those sort of behaviors and customize it. Here we're not changing the fact that it's in a text box so much as we are changing the fact that we're putting a validator in there. That's not part of the framework. The framework doesn't know anything about validating columns on a grid view. However, we could customize the particular columns that we do want validation for and add the validator to that. So now I go and run this and I go to edit that. All right. Now I'm in this mode. I go click update. Ah. Uh, Forgot that stupid line. Does anyone remember what that stupid line is? Yeah. Sometimes I think that every program I've written is a cut and paste from the first Fortran program I wrote in. Let me see. Boy, this is gonna this is gonna be scary when I give you the year of the first Fortran program I wrote. I'm not even going to do it. That's too hard. <laughs> see if you see. If it's, let, let's see if you can, you can guess the year I wrote my first Fortran program. You're close. I'll go 76. 76. Yeah, not bad. And, and that's 1976. I, I, know, I know what it is. Oh, that's what I thought. I was going to say, wow. <laughs> I was doing research to be a Um No, the app settings. Eh? Okay. Uh, if this doesn't have it, I will, because I, I, I still want to save the time of typing. Does anyone know Mr. Gresh, by the way, who teaches here as an adjunct? Okay. Uh, he was my first computer teacher. And the funny thing is, is if you see him, he looks younger than me now. All right, I don't know how that happened. Um, although he was, he was a very young teacher when he taught me. He was probably only a handful of years older than me then. Uh, but I've seemed to to catch up and pass him. Since we're sharing, I wrote my first program in Basic in '89. And that's still pretty good. That's good. What was I doing in 1989? <laughs> I think it was COBOL code. I think it was COBOL in 89. Yeah. 
COBOL for a car rental company, I believe. There we go. We're back in business. Okay. So we're going to see this over and over again, that the validation is one reason that we're going to make a template field, right? Because the default behavior isn't to validate those fields. We have to go in and customize the validation. And we could add additional validation, too. If this was like a numeric field, we could make sure it was a number. If it was a date, we could make sure it was a date or whatever. So we can add whatever sort of validation we want to. We're also going to use this later on, probably not today, but later on when, um, when what? When uh, we don't want a text box at all, but we want a drop down or a check box or some other field control. So we'll, we'll, we'll see that. Because remember, template means we're not going with the plain out of the box vanilla behavior. We're going and we're altering it one way or another. To, to do something more that we needed to do. All right. I'd like to show one more thing today on this. And that is, if I remember right, we have a foreign key constraint that says that the category name has to be unique. So if I type sports in here and update it, boom. It exploded. Can we handle this the same way? When we do a compare validator? Could we do a compare validator? Not easily. Because remember, a compare valid that's a good thought, but a compare validator compares two fields here. Here we would need to compare that field with a list of things. And I don't know if we could do that right off. We really can't handle this one through validators. All right. So what do we do? Well, there's several ways we can prevent an error. All right? And let me rephrase that. There's several ways that we can make sure that errors don't have bad consequences. That is a bad consequence to display that ugly error message because that's confusing, that probably gives potential hackers more information than we wanted to give them, all right? And it's, it was, it's not very meaningful to get an error like that. So that's a bad consequence, those big, ugly error messages like that. And even if we have enabled to suppress error messages, the shorter ugly error messages are just as ugly as the big, ugly error messages. All right. So how can we prevent errors from having a bad consequence? We can actually do it one of three different ways, all right? We've seen one way, and that is by putting validation in, all right? We put a validator in, they forget to enter a value in, all right? It tells them, hey, you need to put a value in there, all right? Easy enough, nothing horrible happened there. We don't display some ugly, incomprehensible error message. We give them a nice, concise error message that tells them what they need to do to fix it. It's about all we can do. Second way, and it's not relevant here, but it will be relevant in the next set of examples that we go over uh, on Thursday, is we design our form where they can't put bad data in. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, maybe we have a drop-down list, you know, where relevant. If there's a field that's a Boolean, for example, and it can only take a yes or no, we use a drop-down. It only contains yes or no, right? How can they mess that up? All right, the form keeps them from entering in bad data. All right, so that's the second option. The third option is to look and say, you know what? We really can't prevent the error from happening, but we're going to be there with our dustpan and broom to tidy up after it blows up and display a nice little error message 
instead of letting a big old ugly error message appear. All right. Some of the database constraints it would be difficult to validate for, and we wouldn't even want to go there. It's easier in, in some cases just to let the statement fail, but display a user-friendly error message. All right. And that's what comes into, again, writing code for events. All right. Let's look at our SQL data source. SQL data source. I think it's here. I stand corrected. It's on the grid view. name of the event. Now, if you notice, let's go back and, and redo that. There is an on row updating and an on row updated event. Just happened. All right. 
The only difference between this is there's a, E also it gets filled out even if there isn't a, 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 a crash. So if you drove home without any accidents, it'd also be a accident report that says you made it home without any accidents. All right. So I guess the analogy sort of falls apart there. All right. The point is, is there are properties on this E object that tells us what happened. And what we can do is we can inspect those properties and determine if there's a problem or not. So, maybe a better way to say it is E exception is the accident report. Because an exception, the word exception used in this context is synonymous with an error. checking for? This is checking to see if there is an exception. What is E? E is a report about everything that happened in this update. One of the things that could have up, uh, happened when I do this update is that there could be an error. So I'm checking to see is there an error associated with this update. So E is the information about the update. Exception is, is there a problem with this update? If there is, then I can do something instead of letting it blow up. So what am I going to do? I'm going to do this. I'm going to put a label up on uh, my page. And I'm going to call it label error. set the text of that to anything I want to. Problem updating. Now, I have to do one more thing. Alright? I have to tell the .NET, .NET framework, hey, I got this one. Alright? So it doesn't try and process it. Someone has to handle these errors. The .NET framework knows that, right? So if you don't handle them, it's going to handle them. How is it going to handle them? It's going to handle them in the most ugly way possible, all right? So we want to handle them, all right? But after we've handled them, we have to tell the .NET framework, hey, we've handled this. And we do that by saying exception handled equals true. So let's follow this through from the beginning. I create an event on my grid view that 
says, after we have tried to 